For a few years in the 1980s, Huey Lewis and the News were the kings of the music hill. The group's poppy and crisp rock and Lewis's distinctive voice helped the band score a string of beloved hits. Here's a look at the real-life story of Huey Lewis. Huey Lewis was born in 1950 in New York City as Hugh Anthony Gregg III. When he was four years old, however, his jazz drumming radiologist father and commercial artist mother moved to San Francisco's Marin County. The area was a center for the Bohemian arts movement, and it was closer to nature than the Big Apple. Lewis was a very smart kid with an early interest in music, so the club-filled area fueled his interests. Unfortunately, the blissful family life didn't last for long because the musician's parents divorced when he was still young. In a 2001 interview with journalist Jill Kramer, Lewis said that the divorce happened when he was 11 or 12 and hinted that the split wasn't entirely amiable. However, in a 2019 post on the Huey Lewis and the News' official Facebook page, the singer notes that the cloud of divorce had an unexpected silver lining. His mother started renting out a room in their home, and the tenant just happened to be a folk musician called Billy Roberts, whose instruments of choice were the guitar and the harmonica. As Lewis noted in the Facebook post, Billy Roberts had a zillion harmonicas, and he gave me a bunch of his old ones. That's how I first got into them. Huey Lewis was a clever kid, so it's no surprise that he was bound for a pretty decent school. However, in an interview with journalist Jill Kramer, the artist revealed that things took a dark turn when his dad wanted to send him to a prep school, and his mother emphatically didn't. They weren't together anymore at that point, and things were already pretty contentious. Lewis's mother even took his father to court over the issue of their son's education. In the end, the case was resolved when the judge asked Lewis what he personally thought about it. He ended up choosing to go away to prep school, but he found the experience markedly different from the brochures. In reminiscing about his prep school experience, Lewis had this to say. My dad had given me the catalog that had a picture of this gorgeous quad with ivy-covered buildings and big trees, and a guy crossing the quad with a gal, Buffy and Biff and she was tremendous looking. Unfortunately, the pretty lady in the catalog turned out to be a marketing trick, and the young man ended up spending four years in a school full of other biffs. In 1968, Huey Lewis took a year off before college and spent it traveling the world. While this was no doubt a cool experience as a whole, it also led to some serious trouble for the soon-to-be music star. Lewis was a long-haired young man, which was significantly worse in dictator Francisco Franco's Spain than it might have been at, say, Woodstock. As a result, his hitchhiking endeavors were less than successful, and it wasn't uncommon for him to wait as long as 12 hours between rides. This gave him a chance to improve his musical skills, though. In remembering his time in Spain, Lewis told an interviewer, the only people who would pick me up were German tourists, so I'd play harmonica by the side of the road until my lips bled. Another Spain-themed pickle happened when Lewis was coming back from Morocco and lost his passport. It was Friday, and he had no money at all, save for what it would take him to get a new passport when the American embassy opened on Monday. Fortunately, those punishing harmonica exercises during the lonely hours by the road ended up saving him. He bumped into a bunch of art students in Seville, and they were so impressed by his harmonica skills that they hooked him up with a guitar player. They ended up playing a pretty big concert, Lewis's first ever. No one can deny that Huey Lewis and the News were massive in the 1980s. However, Lewis and his Merry Men could have been even bigger, financially at least. In the early 1980s, Coca-Cola approached them to appear in their commercials, which would have been a huge deal. After all, Michael Jackson had just shown the world what celebrity endorsements could be, courtesy of his record-breaking $5 million deal with Pepsi. Lewis decided to pass on the opportunity, and while he had his reasons, he was still calling the decision idiotic in 2016, telling CNBC, We had just started selling out concerts, making more money than we'd ever made, and I thought, why would I do this for money? I'm an artist. I'm an artist and an idiot. In 1987, Huey Lewis suddenly lost all hearing in his right ear. This was a major problem because he was at the absolute height of his career at the time, and hearing is generally considered a pretty important skill for a musician. In describing the moment he knew he was losing his hearing, Lewis told an interviewer, I felt like I had been in a swimming pool and my ear was full. I couldn't shake it out or pop my ears. Lewis was eventually diagnosed with many ears disease, which the National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders 
defines as an inner ear disorder that can cause all sorts of problems, including vertigo and tinnitus. No medical professional could fix the issue, and one simply told Lewis to, quote, get used to it. Eventually, it became clear that this was his only option. Lewis soon discovered that amazing musicians like Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys also operated with a similar type of ear condition. As such, Lewis adjusted and was able to carry on his business as usual. Sadly, though, this wouldn't be his last struggle with hearing issues. The film version of Brett Easton Ellis's American Psycho came out in 2000, and like the book, it wasn't shy of showing Patrick Bateman's love for Huey Lewis in the news. However, as M. Live tells us, Lewis actually ended up boycotting the movie. This didn't have anything to do with the scene where an unhinged Bateman, played by Christian Bale, delivers a speech about Lewis's music before dispatching a professional rival, played by Jared Leto, with an axe. You like Huey Lewis in the news? In fact, Lewis was familiar with American Psycho before the film and has told Rolling Stone that he's quite happy to be associated with it. The boycott came after he decided to pull Hip to be Square from the movie's soundtrack album for reasons unrelated to the film itself. However, the people behind the movie claimed that he removed it because he was so disgusted by the film's violence. Understandably, the singer didn't much care for being set up as someone who was easily offended. As it happens, Brett Easton Ellis has expressed regret that he linked Huey Lewis and the News to his work in the first place. In 2014, Ellis told Billboard, they weren't a favorite band. I was much more a Bruce Springsteen person than a Huey Lewis person, but I didn't think they deserved it. I liked them more than the implied criticism of them that's in the text. Who you gonna call to thank for the iconic Ghostbusters theme? It's a good question. Buckle up, because it's about to get complicated. Ghostbusters, what do you want? As Mental Floss and The Ledger Note tell us, the opportunity to write the Ghostbusters theme song came to Ray Parker Jr. after Lindsey Buckingham and Huey Lewis had both declined the honor. Parker certainly succeeded, but before long, Lewis's lawyers came knocking. Per Billboard, the reason was the alleged similarity between Parker's smash hit and Huey Lewis and the News's I Want a New Drug, which had come out just a few months before. The case was eventually settled out of court. In 2001, Lewis decided to weigh in on the ruling on a VH1 Behind the Music episode, saying, However, in the same Behind the Music episode, Lewis also made it pretty clear what he thought about the settlement money, saying, This prompted Parker to sue Lewis for breaching an alleged confidentiality clause from the 1984 lawsuit. Unfortunately, we may never find out how that lawsuit ended, because everyone involved has stayed silent on the issue since then. Rock stardom and domestic bliss seem to always be in direct opposition to each other. According to the Los Angeles Times, it seems that even the relatively wholesome Huey Lewis is no exception. He separated from his wife after they had two children. In an interview with the golf magazine Kingdom, Lewis notes that the pair got married in 1983 in Hawaii, but their union ended up lasting only six years. However, he does maintain that they're, quote, still pals. In 2001, Lewis reflected on the specifics of the relationship in an interview with Jill Kramer. He said he met his wife, Sydney, in the late 1970s when she was the secretary for Bob Brown, Lewis's future manager. The musician also admitted that Huey Lewis and the News' peak success years were quite difficult for his then-wife, telling Kramer, I was gone a lot then, and I worried about it. It was mainly hard on my wife, because she had to take care of everything. In early 2018, Huey Lewis had to once again deal with hearing loss, and this time, things were even more difficult. As Rolling Stone tells us, Lewis was in Dallas to play a concert with his band when his hearing suddenly went haywire. Lewis told the music outlet, I heard this huge noise. It sounded like warfare was going on in the other room. I yelled, what is that? They said, it's just Pat Green, the opening act. Green hadn't suddenly switched to experimental heavy metal. Lewis simply couldn't make any sense of what he heard. Everything was just a horrible racket, and when it was time to perform, he couldn't hear his own voice, let alone find a pitch. After some rapid cancellation of upcoming shows, Lewis started once again seeking medical help for his condition. This proved futile, but as a minor comfort, the musician discovered that his condition came and went depending on the day. 
Some days, he can keep up with a phone conversation with hearing aids on. Other days, he won't even know if the phone rings. Tragically, the condition heavily impacts Lewis's ability to listen to music. On a bad day, he can't find a pitch, and the bass crumbles into a nasty static. When music is played, it just sounds like noise to me. While he could theoretically still perform on a good day, the periodical nature of the hearing loss makes touring borderline impossible. Huey Lewis was in a dark place when he was struggling with his second hearing loss in 2018. The condition left him with hearing that was coming and going, and music sounded like distortion in his ears. This essentially destroyed his ability to reliably perform, and it happened at a time when he and the News were working on a new album of original material, for the first time since 2001's Plan B. As such, Lewis found the experience so profoundly harrowing that he even considered ending his life. Lewis told Rolling Stone, There was literally a roaring tinnitus in my head. There was nothing I can do. I just lay in bed and contemplate my demise. Fortunately, the singer has learned to live with the situation, and he's even devised a scale of 1 to 10 to help others understand how well he's doing on a particular day. He regularly looks into treatments that might help restore his hearing to a state that would allow him to play live again. However, he's also accepted the idea that this might never happen. Has there ever been a more dangerous band than Motley Crue? Throughout the 1980s and into the 1990s, these glam rock trailblazers redefined what it meant to be a rock star in a way that's still unrivaled. Here is the untold truth of Motley Crue. You wouldn't expect members of one of the filthiest, wildest groups in the history of rock and roll to be particularly concerned with their public image, at least not beyond making sure that all their makeup and teased hair were picture perfect. But Motley Crue are reportedly highly protective of their legacy, and what a legacy it is. Um, you said that the more records we sell, the more drugs we get. And the, the drugs are fantastic at the top. <laughs> According to Blabbermouth, band members are extremely selective when it comes to merchandising, and they're unwilling to simply emblazon Motley Crue on every t-shirt, coffee cup, iron-on, and jacket that comes their way. If bassist and chief songwriter Nikki Six can be believed, the band doesn't want to cheapen their legacy by selling out. He said that he and his fellow bandmates don't want Motley Crue to become a group that, quote, were cool once. Here's a perfect example. According to Six, the band thought that the central concept behind Rock of Ages was basically Mamma Mia with electric guitars, so they wanted absolutely nothing to do with that project whatsoever, neither the Broadway production nor the 2012 movie. Judging by the reviews that film received, it's safe to say that was a wise decision. Although the core members of Motley Crue are often perceived as a loyal, tight-knit group of men, there have definitely been a few shake-ups in the lineup over the years. You'd be forgiven if you didn't know the name John Corabi, but he was in Motley Crue once. In fact, he was even the lead vocalist of the group for a spell. As Louder reports, Corabi replaced Vince Neil as the frontman on the band's self-titled 1994 album. As Ultimate Classic Rock notes, he was promptly booted from the band when his vocals for the 1997 album Generation Swine didn't live up to expectations. Kurabi was reduced to a footnote when Vince Neil ultimately returned to the fold in 1997. As he told Rock by Wild in 2012, I was in Motley and I never knew that they were going to bring Vince back. You know, so things have a way of just, life just has a way of working itself out. In fact, Neil is reportedly on friendly terms with Karabi, and guitarist Mick Mars has even collaborated with him on some side project stuff. Meanwhile, Nikki Six seems to have less than fond memories of Karabi, and has even described him as the biggest piece of sh to roam the earth. Every gunslinger knows that one day they'll cross paths with someone who draws faster and shoots straighter. As Ultimate Classic Rock reports, Motley Crue met its match in 1984 when the band toured with Ozzy Osbourne, the Prince of Darkness himself. Osborne was spiraling out of control following the death of his guitarist and friend Randy Rhodes in 1982. He mostly toured and made albums because of sheer inertia. His wife Sharon feared that things would get even worse if he stopped. This was the deranged man that Motley Crue ended up going on tour with, and the war stories from that time are beyond debauched. The Osman soon showed the LA kids that they had a whole lot to learn when it came to the art of self-destructing. Um, we'd always have these crazy parties backstage. He would come onto our bus and say, I'm riding with you guys to the next city. In the 2001 Motley Crue Tell All the Dirt, Nikki Six recalled the day Osborne allegedly ran out of cocaine, so Six jokingly suggested that he snort a line of ants off the sidewalk instead. 
He put the straw to his nose and sent the entire line of ants tickling up his nose with a single monstrous snort. All this snorting ants one that I found me drunk snorting ants on this thing on him. Crazy stuff. Snorting ants, licking up each other's and I'm like, oh, dude, let's just go to the room. Let's just chill out, come on. Are you annoyed by the constant comebacks and semi-annual final tours of old bands that never seem to know when to quit? Apparently, Motley Crue feels your pain, so they've taken steps to ensure that they don't become eternally touring dinosaurs. As Rolling Stone reports, band members are attempting to preserve their legacy through a, quote, cessation of touring agreement. The legally binding contract reportedly went into effect after their aptly named final tour at the end of 2015. Here's how Tommy Lee described their reasoning to Fuse News. How can we confirm this in writing like that this is it's no joke? And like we had like went to corporate lawyers. Sounds pretty serious, but that's not to say there aren't a few loopholes. After all, this is Motley Crue we're talking about. Nothing in the contract prevents them from still being a band, and the agreement says precious little about individual performances. As Global News reports, the band has already, quote, risen from the dead to record new material for the Netflix biopic The Dirt. Really, it's anyone's guess whether we'll eventually see a Motley Crue tour called just 150 one-off concerts in a row and not a tour, honestly. Some bands stay together for decades in order to develop and evolve as a group, but some members of Motley Crue have floated in and out of the project, or at least they're more than happy to try their hand at various side projects. According to Ultimate Classic Rock, Vince Neil was the first band member to stray. He temporarily left the band in 1992 and released a solo album the next year. As he told MTV Rockline, There's still a lot of, a lot of things that, that uh, I haven't accomplished in my life that I still want to do. Um, and, and you have to work to, to achieve any of those goals. While Neil did his best to keep the party spirit high as Motley Crue struggled with murky grunge and misplaced aspirations of growing up, he ultimately realized he was far more effective at his day job. According to Loaded Radio, Tommy Lee isn't terribly fond of his own solo stuff, nor his work with Methods of Mayhem. In fact, he even says solo albums are a waste of time. Meanwhile, Nikki Six has his 6AM supergroup, which may or may not be on hiatus, according to Loudwire. Even the ever-elusive Mick Mars has dabbled in solo projects. Although he hasn't released an album yet, he said he has some interesting things coming down the pipeline. Because don't we all? You wouldn't expect the 5'6 Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich to start picking a fight with the towering rhythm section of Motley Crue. And to be fair, Rolling Stone makes it clear that picking a fight with the Crue boys wasn't one of Ulrich's better ideas. In 1982, Motley Crue was busy hatching the glam rock revolution on the Sunset Strip. Meanwhile, Metallica was still playing thrash metal in venues scattered throughout Los Angeles. This reportedly led to some bad blood between the two groups, and the situation allegedly came to a head one night when Ulrich was standing outside the Troubadour and saw Nikki Six and Tommy Lee on the street. As Ulrich tells it, his immediate reaction was to shout, F Motley Crew." Well, apparently that turned out to be something of a mistake on Ulrich's part, even if his heart was in the right place. Nikki Six started chasing after me, and the one thing I could do, because, you know, five foot six of me, I could, like, run faster than he could in his 16-inch platform boots. The members of Motley Crue have spent a lot of time together over the years. As such, they reportedly weren't too keen to spend the last stages of their touring life punched together in the back of a minivan. According to Blabbermouth, the band traveled together in name only, as each member had his own separate tour bus. So what was the reasoning behind this arrangement? Does it mean they don't like to hang out with each other anymore? depends on who you ask. Mick Mars has accused Vince Neil of distancing himself from the rest of the group. Meanwhile, Neil says everyone's still great friends and claims they made that bus arrangement simply because they could afford to travel in luxury. Since several band members have their families on the road with them, it's not like there's too much room for the kind of rock band nastiness they were once known for. According to Louder, Nikki Six claims that the other members of Motley Crue are, quote, not enemies, but not friends. Would you ever take business advice from Motley Crue? According to Fast Company, there are way worse people to analyze when it comes to vocational success. The band might look like a messy affair, but their debauched antics hide a surprisingly savvy business plan. Nikki Six says he understands why an outsider might have a tough time understanding why the band still exists anymore. However, he points out that Motley Crue have been operating like a well-oiled machine for years. That's thanks to their manager, Alan Kovac who joined the crew back in 1994 and helped orchestrate a formal, structured business attitude in the group. That doesn't mean they can't mess around, it just means there's a core foundation in the business plan that guarantees all the important decisions are made. 
You know, The Dirt, that sordid 2001 tell-all that was adapted into a Netflix biopic in 2019? Well, that whole project is part of their band's marketing strategy. By collaborating with the book's author, the band was able to control the narrative, and they even dropped a Greatest Hits album near the publication date to maximize profits. Motley Crue isn't as much of a boys' club as you might think. In fact, they even used to have a female drummer. According to NRK, the band's new tattoo tour in 2000 was plagued with spinal tap levels of drummer trouble. Tommy Lee wasn't in the band at the time, and his replacement Randy Castillo became ill and was unable to take the stresses of touring. In their search for a replacement, the boys in the band turned their inquiring eye to Samantha Maloney, the former drummer for Hole. In a fix, Nikki Six reportedly contacted Maloney, who immediately jumped on the plane and proceeded to play the rest of the tour. During the band's 2000 appearance on Live with Regis, Regis Philbin asked Maloney the question weighing on everyone's mind. Yeah. My gosh, what's it like to be with these guys? It's insane. Yeah. It's insane. <laughs> More insane than being with Courtney Love? Uh, it's a different insanity. <laughs> The members of Motley Crue were extremely courteous with Maloney, and the band took her in as one of their own. Vince Neil was even visibly proud of her during concerts. However, she was certainly well aware of the band's checkered history. In fact, writer Neil Strauss was following the band around and interviewing them for the dirt, so she got to hear quite a few sordid stories straight from the horse's mouth. In 2009, she admitted that she was avoiding reading the book because she didn't want it to affect the way she thought of the Crue guys. If you're looking for non-stop debauchery, look no further than Motley Crue's early years. The music is Motley great. Crue, the way they dress. They're cute. Oh, they're, they're awesome. Yeah, they're just... Totally babes. Nikki Six confessed to doing something quite unseemly to a police car in those heady days. I didn't smash the cop car window. I peed in the, the cop car window. window. And on one occasion, the band reportedly invited everyone in the audience to party at their place after a gig. The apartment they lived in at the time wasn't any great shakes either, to put it lightly. According to The Dirt, members shared an apartment near the legendary Whiskey A Go Go, a venue they played often. Well, there was a mountain of beer cans outside. There was one plant in the corner, it was dead. It was pretty destroyed. The apartment was done. According to Ultimate Guitar, those early parties were beyond nuts. People got utterly wasted, and there were orgies, lots of them. Wall to wall girls, blonde, big t little clothing. They all want Nikki Six. They want one that one half naked in there. I hated it. According to Rolling Stone, people would pour inside the crew place to party, and many of those visitors were future rock stars who would later find success in bands like Rat and Wasp. So just how raunchy were these parties? We would have never survived with this. The social media, we would have tweeted things. None of us are throwing eggs at houses. Take that. <laughs> George Michael carried an air of mystery about him, which matched his soulfulness and seriousness about his art. That all hinted at a man who dealt with profound sadness, misery, and heartbreak. Here's the tragic real-life story of George Michael. The early years of George Michael don't seem to have been outwardly traumatic, but they were reportedly marked with a damaging coldness and distance from his family. The future star was raised in a small London apartment by two parents, but his father, an immigrant who ran a restaurant, was rarely around, which created a disconnect between father and son. According to People magazine, Michael said, I was never praised, never held, so it wasn't exactly the little house on the prairie. While he was interested in music from an early age, he didn't realize he wanted to pursue music as his life's work until after he got seriously hurt. In his memoir, Bear, he wrote, at the age of about eight, I had a head injury, and I know it sounds bizarre and unlikely, but it was quite a bad bang, and I had it stitched up and stuff. Suddenly, all I wanted to know about was music. He didn't let his father know about his ambitions right away. He told Event Magazine, Funnily enough, my father always used to say that he didn't think I could sing. According to a Daily Mail interview with Michael's former Wham! manager, the singer's decades-long battle with intoxicating substances began relatively late in adulthood, after he'd started his solo career. That drug use ultimately turned varied and voluminous. In September 2008, police in North London discovered Michael in a public restroom using crack cocaine and marijuana. The amounts on his person were small, and he was released without further legal action. According to Kenny Goss, Michael's former romantic partner of 13 years, taking drugs was a matter of course. Goss told The Sun, I would find drugs and flush everything down the toilet. He was absent-minded, so he would just think he'd lost them. He knew how I felt about it, and I would say that was probably the only area that he wasn't really honest with me about. 
Michael himself told The Guardian in 2009 that at the peak of his drug usage, he smoked in the neighborhood of two dozen joints each day. By the time of the interview, he was down to seven or eight a day. After losing one of his romantic partners to AIDS back in 1993, Michael was understandably left devastated and in deep mourning for a prolonged period of time. That only got worse when in 1996, his mother received news that she had a rapidly destructive terminal case of cancer. She was able to spend one last Christmas with Michael and the rest of her family, eventually passing away just two months later in February 1997. In the documentary George Michael Freedom, Michael admitted that he was spiritually crushed after her passing. The singer subsequently fell into a deep, dark sadness. He admitted, I'd never felt that kind of depression. It was something different to grief. It was on top of grief. I was grieving for my mother still, but it was something else. It was the darkest time. I just kind of kept banging my head against a brick wall for the best part of three years uh, and becoming more and more depressed. It was like a vicious cycle. In the documentary, Michael also revealed that the mental darkness left him feeling like his life had been a waste of time and that even two decades on, he'd never quite moved on from his mother's death. While Michael publicly exhibited the effects of a lifelong struggle with substance abuse, his drug issues may have troubled him far more than his fans were aware, and especially in the last few years of his life. A friend of Michael's told The Sun, I believe easy access to drugs was the cause of his problems. Once this disease gets hold of you, it's hard to fight it. A source close to Michael told The Telegraph that the singer's drug problem almost took his life more than once. The individual added, He's been rushed to the ER on several occasions. He used heroin. I think it's amazing he's lasted as long as he has. Michael scored his last major UK hit in 2012, and he'd largely retreated from public life, except for the occasional live performance. But at Christmas, the veteran superstar is on millions of people's minds, thanks to his contributions to the holiday music canon. He was a soloist on Band-Aid's Do They Know It's Christmas and recorded Last Christmas with Wham! It's especially sad, then, that Michael passed away on Christmas Day 2016 while his songs were undoubtedly making people happy in other parts of the world. Michael's partner, Fadi Fawaz, went over to the singer's house in the morning as the two planned to have Christmas lunch together. According to The Telegraph, that's when he discovered Michael, quote, lying peacefully in bed. Authorities called to the scene were initially puzzled by the death but were not suspicious of foul play. A few months later, a coroner revealed that Michael passed away at the age of 53 from natural causes, specifically issues related to the heart and liver. Fawaz doesn't believe that Michael passed from natural causes. He thinks he took his own life, based on his knowledge of Michael's behavior and the date on which his death occurred. Fawaz told The Telegraph, George died on his mother's birthday, so that might answer a few questions. Not to mention it took five attempts to manage to end his life. That would mean that if Michael did pass away from heart and liver problems in 2016, he had sadly attempted to take his own life on four previous occasions. Reclusive 80s art rock star Kate Bush is making headlines in 2022 thanks to Stranger Things. So how did Bush get her big break? And where did she disappear to? Keep watching to find out. It's no surprise to learn that Kate Bush came from a creative family. Her mother, Hannah, was a devotee of the traditional music of her native Ireland and would sing and dance at home. When I was very little, it was always being played in the house. According to Kate Bush, the biography by Rob Jovanovich, Bush would dance too, but privately, along to songs that came on the television. Her brother, John, who was 14 years older, was a prolific poet who would write continuously and share his verses with his younger sister. But John didn't just set a creative example for the young Kate Bush. Heading away to college while Kate was still a small child, John would make vital friendships that would become instrumental in helping to get his sister's prodigious songwriting talents recognized a decade later, including with Dave Gilmore, who was soon to become one of the most successful musicians in the world as part of Pink Floyd. In 1973, while Gilmore was taking a break from touring and recording with Floyd, John invited the musician, who was interested in developing his own acts, to come to the family home and secretly listen to his sister practice her self-written songs on the piano. Gilmore was impressed enough to begin working with Kate, then better known as Kathy, and worked with her on a professionally recorded demo, which included the classic song, The Man with the Child in His Eyes. She was barely 15 years old, but would eventually find herself signed to EMI on the road to pop stardom. As Kate Bush continued to work on her material, she also spent years in London, where she took singing lessons and attended courses in dance and mime to broaden her artistic palette, according to her biography. By 1978, Bush was ready to release her music into the world. But the world of music had turned dramatically since the heady art rock days of Pink Floyd's pomp. 
At the time, the UK was experiencing the aftershocks of the punk explosion the previous year, with young music fans convinced that pop songwriting could never be the same again. Punk seemingly imbued all corners of the music industry with a new sense of rebelliousness, while for lighter-hearted listeners, disco was the dance floor-filling genre of the day. Bush's debut single, Wuthering Heights, an eccentric romantic song of yearning based on the novel of the same name by Emily Bronte, subverted the landscape, sounding like nothing else in the pop charts at the time. And I thought it was just perfect material for the song. It's just so passionate and full of impact. It's the song went to number one in the UK, an instant breakthrough that allowed Bush to release two full studio albums in the same year to critical acclaim and commercial success. Despite the immense impact of Wuthering Heights, Kate Bush's debut single was so confounding to many music fans and journalists that it was assumed it was nothing more than a strange novelty single. While Bush herself became a divisive figure among the pop-following public, it would take years and the release of much more Bush material, culminating perhaps in her biggest-selling pop album, 1985's Hounds of Love, for her enduring artistry to become undeniable even to those who failed to appreciate her singular pop aesthetic. But while Bush has grown into a musical icon for pop songwriters everywhere, her importance for women artists in the UK music industry was far more immediate. As highlighted by The Guardian, Wuthering Heights was notable for being the first song by a woman to hit the top of the singles chart that the artist herself had composed. The feat may not be attention-grabbing today in the age of heavyweight pop songwriters like Taylor Swift and Adele, but Bush's breakthrough constituted a highly symbolic moment for women in the industry. As Kate Bush's career progressed, it became apparent that she was both a single-minded experimentalist and a consummate craftswoman, with the technical songwriting and performance abilities necessary to fulfill her unconventional musical vision. I, I really like what I do, and I think, I think that's what it's all about. And while Bush's music may appear to be the antithesis of the punk movement it so strongly contrasted with back in the late 1970s, she came to count among her fans several figures from punk's ranks. Not least, the original British punk snarler John Lydon, aka Johnny Rotten. Lydon has been effusive in his praise for Bush in numerous interviews over the years, including a 2001 interview in which the Sex Pistols frontman noted that both he and Bush had shared the experience of attracting ire from critics for their unconventional vocal styles. And even more surprisingly, it has also emerged that Lydon wrote a song for Bush, hoping that she would perform it, Lydon told Uncut Magazine in 2014. Years ago, I sent Bush a song I'd written. I don't think she understood it. It was called Bird in Hand. It was about the illegal exportation of parrots from South America. No, don't laugh. It's a serious subject. It's cruel. But I think she thought it was a reference to her, which it certainly wasn't. Bush never recorded the song, though the rejection doesn't seem to have impacted Lydon's admiration for her. He added, She's a wonderful, wonderful woman, stunningly innovative and creative, one of our finest. A huge part of Kate Bush's success was her willingness to harness the new medium of music videos, which were growing in importance as marketing devices and extensions of the songs themselves in the early years of her career. From Wuthering Heights to 1985's massive single Running Up That Hill, Bush starred in some of the most iconic music videos of the period. But it was perhaps the follow-up to Running Up That Hill, Cloud Busting, which best exemplifies a musician's ability to use all the tools at her disposal to expand her chosen theme. The video shows Kate Bush in the guise of a young boy, whose father, played by Donald Sutherland, is an eccentric scientist and inventor of a cloud-busting machine who was arrested, leaving the boy alone. The story sounds like the stuff of fantasy, but in fact was inspired by the real-life memoirs of Peter Reich, whose father, the Austrian-born Wilhelm, was a psychoanalyst who truly believed he had created such a machine. Bush reportedly read Reich's memoir and was moved by the portrayal of the father-son relationship, inspiring the unusual hit song. And I think really the biggest inspiration is people. I think uh, people are, are just so inspiring. When the video was complete, Bush sent a copy to Reich for his approval, who said that he and his family were entranced and that Bush had, quote, tapped precisely into a unique and magical fulfillment of father-son devotion, emotion, and understanding, according to Dazed. Despite enjoying 15 years of considerable commercial success and widespread critical acclaim, following the release of her album The Red Shoes in 1993, by 1994, Kate Bush largely retreated from the glare of public life. Soon, her absence from the music industry became tabloid fodder, with newspapers labeling her a misfit and a recluse and speculating on her mental health and private life. Among her fans, however, it became the stuff of legend, provoking works of art that attempted to penetrate her intense privacy. The 2007 documentary Comeback Kate explores the impact her absence had on those who love her music, while more eccentric projects such as Waiting for Kate Bush, a book by John Mendelssohn described as a hybrid of satirical comic novel and music biography, which, along with the life story of Kate Bush, offers a fictional story of a superfan attempting to connect with his missing musical hero. 
Bush only made a handful of public appearances during these years before re-emerging in 2005 with her long-awaited double album, Ariel. The reclusive singer hadn't turned her back on fame as the result of a nervous breakdown or strange new creative obsession. As would eventually be revealed, Bush, who it is worth recalling first shot to pop fame at the tender age of 19, was enjoying living a normal life of domesticity and parenthood. News that Bush had become a parent emerged alongside news of her comeback through her friend Peter Gabriel, who in a 2004 interview told the world, Kate had a son and lost her mom, and I think that kept her occupied. I spoke to her quite recently, in fact, and she's just about finished on a new record. It is exciting. She's being a mom and loving it. So, if you like, music's gone from being full-time to being part-time, so that slows you down. The news that Bush had given birth to a son, Bertie, only appeared in print some five years after the child's birth, per the Evening Standard. In an interview with The Guardian, Bush explained that she valued learning the mundane necessities of domestic life, such as vacuuming and doing laundry, saying that she felt privileged that she had been able to carve out a normal life for herself and her family despite her fame. Think of your favorite singer, and you also probably know who their favorite singer is, too. For Paul McCartney, no one beats Little Richard. For David Bowie, vocal inspiration came from avant-garde crooner Scott Walker. And Adele has made no secret of the fact that her great hero is a classic blues singer, Etta James. So it might be expected that Kate Bush would similarly wear her influences when it comes to vocalists proudly on her sleeve. But perhaps unsurprisingly, Bush gave a rather unusual answer when asked this common music press interview question, telling an interviewer in 1996 that her favorite singer was the Blackbird, her second favorite, the Thrush. Bush's love of the Blackbird is apparent on her 2005 comeback album, Ariel, which features as part of its album art the waveform of a Blackbird song, as well as recordings of Birdsong throughout the album. Though Kate Bush continued to keep press appearances to a minimum, in 2016, she was driven to share her thoughts on two artists whose deaths deeply affected millions, David Bowie, who died in January of that year, and Prince, who died in April. Bush had been a lifelong Bowie admirer, having witnessed him performing live in his seminal final concerts in the guise of Ziggy Stardust, according to Mojo. Speaking to The Guardian in the aftermath of Bowie's death, Bush praised the Starman singer, saying, He was intelligent, imaginative, brave, charismatic, cool, sexy, and truly inspirational both visually and musically. Similarly, Bush was quick to pay tribute to Prince, whom she had collaborated with on her 1993 album Blood Red Shoes. A statement published on Bush's official website read, he was such an inspiration, playful and mind-blowingly gifted. He was the most inventive and extraordinary live act I've seen. The world has lost someone truly magical. Good night, dear Prince." Elsewhere, Bush praised his playfulness and sweet character, as well as his incredible productivity in contrast to the slow process of her own songwriting. Though Kate Bush has continued to keep projects to a minimum in recent decades, there have nevertheless been some moments when the English songwriter has come to dominate the cultural zeitgeist. One such moment occurred in 2014, when Bush, who had not performed on stage for 35 years by that point, announced that she would perform a 22-date London residency, titled Before the Dawn, tickets for which reportedly sold out in 15 minutes. Rolling Stone later described the shows as a spectacular return to live performance. But another more unexpected Kate Bush moment occurred as recently as 2012. 22, when, spoiler alert, the singer's seminal 1985 single Running Up That Hill was featured heavily in the fourth season of the 1980s set Netflix horror drama Stranger Things. The prominence of the song on the hit series, the script for which Bush read personally before giving clearance for her song's use, made the song an unexpected summer smash, sending it to the top of the iTunes charts in both the UK and the US, and launching it up the Billboard Hot 100. Billboard reports that over the course of the final week of May, Spotify plays for the song in the US rose by around 9,000 you're a Kate Bush fan? Uh, yeah. Now I am. Really? Yeah, mega fan. On her website, Bush thanked her fans and wrote that she loves the show, calling it fantastic and gripping, adding, I wait with bated breath for the rest of the series in July. David Byrne is best known as the eccentric frontman of Talking Heads. But that's not all there is to know about him, as he's a man of many talents and endeavors. Keep watching to discover the untold truth of one of the most unique individuals in rock music history. David Byrne was born in Scotland on May 14, 1952. Two years later, he and his family made their way to Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And then when he was eight or nine, they settled in Maryland. As a kid, he was kicked out of his school choir because of his less than extraordinary pipes. His own father, Tom, even once flat out stated to the Washington Post, he couldn't sing. But that setback didn't turn off the young David from music forever. As his father recalled, he had a little record player when he was three. It was a cheap little thing, but he played it quite well, and he was always careful not to damage the records. David used his dad's modified tape machine to make music starting from a very young age. 
and he also learned a variety of instruments, such as violin and guitar. And he enjoyed messing with stretching frequencies and mixing tracks. As for David's own thoughts about the importance of vocal technique in music, he once said, The better the singer's voice, the harder it is to believe what they're saying. So I turn my weakness into strengths. Why not give it a try? <laughs> if it fails, go somewhere else. Yeah. By the time David Byrne entered high school, he knew how to play a variety of instruments, like the violin, accordion, and guitar. After he started with his record player when he was three, he then began playing harmonica at age five. He came by music honestly, with his father working as an electronics engineer. While growing up in the 1960s, he formed his first band, Revelation, which mostly performed covers. As he told Rolling Stone in 1983, I think we did a couple of Beatles songs, Rolling Stone songs, You Really Got Me, stuff like that. After Revelation broke up, Byrne headed to college, where he played the coffeehouse circuit as a solo artist. In addition to his love of music, he also had a love of science instilled in him by his father. He even considered attending vocational school before ultimately deciding on art school, specifically the Rhode Island School of Design, also known as RISD, and then the Maryland Institute College of Art. As he recalled to Rolling Stone, the graffiti at RISD looked the best. It looked like it had the most interesting people there, so I thought, even if I don't like the subject, I don't want to hang around with a bunch of deadbeats for four years. Byrne's instincts proved correct, as he met some of his future Talking Heads bandmates at RISD. While attending RISD, Byrne was involved in a functional design program called the Bauhaus Theory Course. Bauhaus is a method founded in Germany that replaces the traditional pupil-teacher relationship. It aims to bring art, architecture, the performing arts, and design back into everyday life and for it to be taken as seriously as fine art. Alas, Byrne's teachers weren't very impressed with his creative pursuits. One time, he had his beard shaved on stage while accompanied by an accordion as a showgirl displayed cards written in Russian. Soon after, he was kicked out of the school. He's been quoted as saying, I think art school is a real racket, especially in this country. You run into a couple of good teachers and some interesting students, but for the amount of money you spend, it's not worth it. But it wasn't all a wash. During Byrne's time at RISD, he made some very important connections, as he met future Talking Heads band members Chris Franz and Tina Weymouth, who were dating at the time, and married each other in 1977. After graduating, they joined Byrne in New York. Not only is David Byrne a famous musician, he's also a nonfiction author and a conceptual artist who's written books on everything from music to epismatology. His published works cover a variety of vastly different subjects. 2009's Bicycle Diaries, for example, is a journal of his cycling ventures through cities around the world. He's also been known to design bike racks. Byrne has also produced a multimedia project called Reasons to be Cheerful, which offers stories to help people be optimistic about the state of the world, including gains in the solar industry and efforts to eliminate poverty. Considering his versatility, it's safe to assume that all of his exploits also contribute to the quality of his songwriting. As he told Rolling Stone in 2018, You can only slog away at writing a song for so long and then you've kind of gotten the water out of the well, and you need to let the well fill up again. I also compartmentalize a lot. I focus on one thing for a few hours and then break for lunch and work on something else. What if we started a project and brought some of those reasons to be cheerful into sharper focus? The 1977 Talking Heads song Psycho Killer was reportedly inspired by some of David Byrne's own personal experience. His temper and dishonest dealings caused plenty of consternation between him and his bandmates, particularly toward the end of their time together. He would bill himself as the sole creator of the band, which caused a rift between him and drummer Chris France. As France wrote in his 2020 memoir, Remain in Love, the more successful Talking Heads became, the more cold and dyspeptic David became. From France's vantage point, the trouble with Byrne came down to his self-centeredness. As France told The Guardian in 2020, it's like he can't help himself. His brain is wired in such a way that he doesn't know where he ends and other people begin. Since his Talking Heads days, though, Byrne has mellowed out and come to certain realizations. As he confessed to The Guardian in 2018, I think I probably did not behave all that well all the time. Neither did the others. It was a very messy thing. But to hold on to that seems like, well, that was quite a while ago. 
He also made sure to note, I can imagine I must at times have been a real pain in the ass to deal with. In May 1977, David Byrne made one of the most important connections of his life when he met Brian Eno at London's Rock Garden while Eno was with his friend and fellow musician, John Cale of the Velvet Underground. The Talking Heads were opening for the Ramones that day, and Eno invited Byrne back to his apartment to listen to music after the concert. What followed was a fruitful and lasting partnership, as Eno went on to produce three of the Talking Heads' albums and three of Byrne's solo projects. Eno's first collaboration with the Heads resulted in their first Top 40 hit, a cover of Al Green's Take Me to the River. But Byrne and Eno ran into some heat when they tried to claim sole writing credits on what is widely considered the Talking Heads' masterpiece album, 1980's Remain in Light. Decades later, Eno and Byrne reunited for their last collaboration, the 2008 album Everything That Happens Will Happen Today. As Byrne recalled to The Independent, Eno gave me confidence in the studio to go in with nothing prepared. Considering his prolific and varied artistic pursuits, it should come as no surprise that Byrne has also tried his hand at filmmaking. In 1986, he directed the satirical feature True Stories. It starred the likes of John Goodman and Swoozy Kurtz, and it's just as weird as Byrne is. It's set in Virgil, Texas, and it focuses on a handful of characters who have all been the subject of tabloid news headlines. In a 2018 interview with Rolling Stone, he reflected back on how the film was misinterpreted upon its release. As he noted, The reaction and appreciation in Europe was closer to what I intended the film to be. You could point out things that are strange and wacky, but you can still love them. In the US, it was taken to be ironic and critical. A New Yorker looking down his nose at the simple wacky people in the heartland, which is not what I intended. True Stories eventually became part of the prestigious Criterion collection of films in 2018. It would be Byrne's last time behind the camera for a feature, but it hasn't been his only contribution to the medium. He's also collaborated with acclaimed directors like Jonathan Demme, who directed the Talking Heads concert documentary Stop Making Sense, and Spike Lee, who directed American Utopia, which is a film version of Byrne's Broadway show of the same name. Outside of Talking Heads, Byrne is a prolific solo musician who has released records with younger artists who have upheld a tradition of artsy alternative rock. He was a backup singer for the Arcade Fire track, Speaking in Tongues, as part of the deluxe version of their 2010 album, The Suburbs. And in 2012, he and Annie Clark, aka St. Vincent, released the collaborative album, Love This Giant. Byrne has also demonstrated his appreciation for the younger generation through his cover work. In his Broadway show, American Utopia, he performed the Janelle Monet song, Hell You Tom Bout, which is a protest anthem speaking out about police brutality against the black community. Monet never officially released the song, but Byrne discovered it by watching a video of her performing it in 2015. As Byrne has said of the track, here was a protest song that doesn't hector or preach at us. It simply asks us to remember and acknowledge these lives that have been lost. Asked what she would think of a white man of a certain age singing this particular song. Monet was flattered when Byrne approached her for permission to perform the song. And she told the Associated Press, I was moved that he reached out and asked if he could include the song in his show. I thought that was so kind of him, and of course I said yes. The song's message and names mentioned need to be heard by every audience. If you've ever seen a picture of David Byrne performing or have been lucky enough to catch a Talking Heads concert, then chances are you've seen him in his signature oversized suits. But if you're looking for an explanation for why he used to deck himself out in such a fashion, don't expect to find one anytime soon. He did address the topic briefly in a bizarre interview with various versions of himself. As Byrne told Byrne, I like symmetry and geometric shapes. I wanted my head to appear smaller, and the easiest way to do that was to make my body bigger, because music is very physical. And often the body understands it before the head. Sometimes the answer is just as strange as the mystery. The suit's designer, Gail Blacker, described it in 1984. It's more of an architectural project than a clothing project. Ultimately, it probably makes sense to know that the nonsensical suit was most famously worn in the concert film Stop Making Sense. One of the most recent wacky and political Broadway musicals is the brainchild of David Byrne. Known as American Utopia, it originally opened for a limited run in October 2019, and it was met with positive reviews. 
The cabaret-style show is based on Byrne's 2018 studio album of the same name, and it consists of a cast of 12 musicians performing about a dozen songs on a minimally decorated set. As NME described it in the review, it's a show that blurs the lines between gig and theater, poetry and dance, a full spectrum of culture under one roof. So how do you think it'll resonate with Americans now after the pandemic? Uh, it's going to seem like uh, it was made for this time, I think. American Utopia was eventually adapted into a feature film concert documentary directed by Spike Lee that features classic Talking Heads hits like Once in a Lifetime and Burning Down the House. Other highlights from the set list include Everybody's Coming to My House and a cover of the electronic song Toe Jam, which was co-written by Fatboy Slim and Dizzy Rascal. The musical is set to make a comeback to the Broadway stage in September 2021. Michael Jackson had a huge 1983. He sold millions of copies of his album Thriller and starred in one of the most popular, famous, and well-produced music videos of all time. This is the untold truth of Michael Jackson's Thriller video. When Michael Jackson's Thriller started to drop down the charts in 1983, Jackson grew unnerved and pressed executives on how to restore the LP to its number one perch. Epic Records head of promotions Frank DeLeo suggested a third music video for the album's title track, which wasn't even slated to be a single, telling Jackson at the time, It's simple. All you have to do is dance, sing, and make it scary. However, Epic wouldn't pay for it. The label spent $250,000 on the video for Billie Jean, but made Jackson pay the $150,000 budget for Beat It himself. The proposed cost of the Thriller video? Slightly less than a million dollars. After a screaming, profanity-laced phone call with Jackson and director John Landis, CBS Records head Walter Yetnikoff offered up $100,000, leaving the creative team to find the rest of the money elsewhere. Landis's production partner George Fulsey and Jackson's lawyer John Branca hatched a plan. Raise money by pre-selling the rights to a behind-the-scenes documentary shot during Thriller production. MTV, which to that point had never paid for content, contributed $250,000, and Showtime paid $300,000. According to The Guardian, Jackson made up a lot of the difference out of his own pocket. In August 1983, film director John Landis received a phone call from Michael Jackson. Landis had recently helmed several big movies, including the horror comedy An American Werewolf in London, which Jackson so enjoyed that he wanted the director to tell another werewolf story and helm his Thriller video. The singer and the filmmaker met, and Landis dismissed the notion of presenting Thriller as a typical, cheaply made music video. Instead, he thought it would be shot like a real movie on classy 35mm film stock. Because I knew by exploiting Michael's name, I could get it booked in the theaters. A musical number set to the song Thriller would comprise most of the video, but it would also have a scripted drawing device. Landis and Jackson worked out a story about a guy who takes a young woman on a date and transforms into a bloodthirsty horror movie monster before her very eyes. Jackson was all in, especially after Landis said he could probably get an American werewolf in London makeup master Rick Baker involved. When I first walked in Rick's studio, it was like a museum of horror. I mean, all these faces, and I was so amazed. One major part of the early concept was rejected. Landis told The Guardian that they initially planned to make Jackson turn into a four-legged creature, but said, We came to the conclusion that if Michael was going to dance, it would be a hell of a lot easier for his monster to have two legs instead of four. And so that's what happened, although Jackson's character doesn't, per common knowledge, become a werewolf. According to Baker, he technically portrays a werecat. Thriller hit MTV and other outlets in 1983, the same year that Flashdance was a hit in movie theaters and made a star out of Jennifer Beals. According to Vanity Fair, Beals passed on the female role in the Thriller video, and after a lengthy search, director John Landis cast Ola Ray as the poodle skirt-wearing young woman in the video's fake horror film as well as Michael Jackson's date, who witnesses his transformation into a monster. According to Landis, I auditioned a lot of girls, and this girl, Ola Ray, first of all, she was crazy for Michael. She had such a great smile. I just stared at the, uh, John Landis and had this grin on my face like, ah, oh, you gotta give it to me, I would love to do it. Only later did Landis realize that Ray was a former Playboy playmate, which threatened her involvement in the video because Jackson thought it might come across as improper for him to be sharing the screen with a model from a racy magazine. Landis talked Jackson out of getting a new actress by reminding him that Ray was a playmate in Playboy, not in Thriller. The actress and the musician wound up getting along just fine, more than fine actually. Ray recalled, I had some intimate moments with him in his trailer. I won't say that I've seen him in his birthday suit, but close enough. Before any of the thriller fun, monster transformations, choreographed zombie dances, creepy yellow eyes, the video begins with a brief bit of text on screen. 
Due to my strong personal convictions, I wish to stress that this film in no way endorses a belief in the occult. That's a pretty serious statement, and one that makes the silly horror movie inspired fun to follow seem like it's going to be a lot darker and menacing than it is. It's also one Jackson felt personally compelled to include. After production on the video wrapped, Jackson, a practicing Jehovah's Witness, was told by leaders of his church that they thought Thriller encouraged demon worship, and if it were released, he'd be excommunicated. Thoroughly upset, Jackson ordered his lawyer to destroy the Thriller negatives. He wouldn't do it, and instead locked up the footage and gave Jackson the idea to let Thriller out, but just with a denouncing disclaimer tacked on to the start. The singer liked that idea and later told Jehovah's Witness publication Awake, I just intended to do a good, fun short film, not to purposely bring to screen something to scare people or to do anything bad. The premise of the Thriller music video is fairly straightforward. Jackson's character takes his date to a horror movie and then makes her life into one when he transforms into a monstrous creature and leads a horde of other scary creatures, both ghoulish and undead. But for director John Landis, Thriller was about something more. According to Vanity Fair, Landis directed Jackson to add an element of forwardness to his role, with an eye toward interesting the singer's many female fans by making him appear more manly and virile. Additionally, Landis equates the process of man turning to beast in thriller and in other werewolf-based movies with puberty, writing in monsters and movies. In adolescence, youngsters begin to grow hair in unexpected places, and parts of their anatomy swell and grow. Everyone experiences these physical transformations in their bodies and new, unfamiliar sexual thoughts in their minds. No wonder we readily accept the concept of a literal metamorphosis. I'm not like other guys. Thriller, of course, came from the Michael Jackson album also called Thriller. The record was a major hit that sold millions of copies and spawned numerous hit singles, which in turn led to more album sales. The LP is only nine tracks long, and seven of those were commercially released singles. Billie Jean and Beat It went the extra mile all the way to number one. Title track Thriller was the seventh and final Thriller single, released to stores and radio in January 1984, well over a year after the album debuted. The cultural event that was the video for Thriller pushed sales of the single, too, and the song hit number four on the pop chart. The horror mini-movie also directly led to Thriller flying off the shelves again. Millions of people who somehow hadn't yet purchased the album were inspired to do so, and during the peak of the video's popularity, it sold more than a million copies a week. By the time Thriller's sales cycle wound down in 1984, it was the best-selling LP of all time in the United States, with sales of 33 million. Michael Jackson's Thriller clip permanently elevated the medium of music video to artistic and cinematic relevance at a time when it was still relatively new and directionless. Thriller also helped steer toward importance and bring a new standard operating protocol to another kind of video, home video. In the 1980s, millions of consumers were purchasing their first VCRs. Either in the VHS or Betamax format, the TV accessory allowed them to watch movies or other content at home via a cassette borrowed for the cost of a few bucks from a local video rental outlet. This was the business model in home video for most of the early to mid-1980s. Studios and publishers charged about $90 for tapes and sold almost exclusively to rental stores, which would then charge customers a few bucks to rent it for a day or two. The perfect video store Welcome to Blockbuster Video is popping up all over the country. A video cassette of Thriller opened the door to price-to-own videos. According to Vanity Fair, Vestron Video helped offset the high production cost of Thriller by paying for the VHS and Betamax distribution rights for the making Michael Jackson's Thriller documentary, and then gave it a $29.95 retail price tag. Within just a few months of release in November 1983, it had sold over a million copies, easily making it the best-selling home video ever to that point. There's even data to suggest that the existence of making Michael Jackson's Thriller helped fuel the massive rise of VCR sales in late 1983. Thriller was a watershed moment in music video. Prior to its production in 1983, music videos weren't taken seriously or considered anything more than a way to cheaply promote a single or an album. Early music videos were usually shot on video, not film, adding a cheap look to a cheap production. A singer or a band might do little more than stand in an unadorned studio and lip sync to the recording. Thriller was one of the first music videos to show that the medium carried the potential for greatness, and not only did critics acknowledge its importance, but they kept doing so for years afterward. In 1984, Making Michael Jackson's Thriller won the Grammy Award for Best Video Album, and in a 1999 end-of-the-century countdown, MTV named Thriller the number one music video of all time. Less than two years later, sister network VH1 would also name Thriller the top video ever made. 
In 2009, the Library of Congress added Thriller to the National Film Registry, naming it part of its collection of films that should be, quote, preserved as cultural, artistic, and or historical treasures for generations to come. And yet, despite all these fancy awards, Thriller didn't win the one prize that seemed like a lock. At the inaugural MTV Video Music Awards in 1984, Thriller surprisingly lost Video of the Year to the cars you might think. Ola Ray took home a lot of memories and stories from her time co-starring in the landmark music video, and as later legal filings would indicate, that's about all the actress and model took home. So, what are we gonna do now? In May 2009, Ray sued Jackson along with his production company for breach of contract. The actress claimed that back in the 1980s, she was promised a portion of the thriller profits, and yet, more than two decades later, she hadn't received any money since some initial payments. Ray's attorney, Jason Feldman, told the New York Daily News, We don't believe they were complete, and they were never timely. The publication reported that the most substantial chunk of money the actress received came in 1998, 15 years after Thriller was shot. Jackson died a few weeks after the suit was filed, and according to TMZ, the singer's estate settled with Ray in 2013 to the tune of $75,000. In 2017, Ray had to file a lawsuit again when she alleged that she wasn't paid her share for a 3D re-release of the Thriller video. The massively successful Thriller video was a close collaboration between performer Michael Jackson and director John Landis, although it would seem that of the pair, only Jackson greatly benefited financially from the project. In January 2009, nearly three decades after production on the video wrapped, Landis sued Jackson and his production company for having failed to fork over what was due over the years. According to the suit, the Thriller video became a worldwide mega-hit and an iconic pop culture phenomenon that has continued to generate profits for defendants Optimum Productions and Michael Jackson, who have wrongfully refused to pay or account for such profits to plaintiff. The suit alleged that Landis didn't receive his promised 50% cut of the profits and that Jackson and company acted with, quote, fraudulent, malicious, and oppressive conduct in withholding what The Hollywood Reporter said amounted to about $2.3 million. Jackson died about six months later, and his estate settled with Landis in 2012. Thriller never really stopped being popular. As of September 2020, the video, hosted by Michael Jackson's official YouTube account, had racked up nearly 700 million views. This is to say nothing of the countless videos, viral and otherwise, of people recreating the familiar Thriller dance moves, particularly the stylized zombie movements, at weddings, block parties, and Halloween celebrations. Certainly the largest example of the phenomenon. In 2009, 13,957 people in Mexico performed the Thriller dance all at once, setting a Guinness World Record. Now it's official. What's likely the most popular second-generation Thriller video came from an unlikely place, a prison in the Philippines. According to NPR, government security consultant Byron Garcia instituted an exercise program in the mid-2000s at the Cebu Provincial Detention and Rehabilitation Center. Sessions had been previously sparsely attended, so Garcia introduced elaborately choreographed dance routines, and before long, as many as 1,500 inmates reported to the prison yard to learn some moves. Garcia taped and uploaded videos of the sessions to YouTube, and in 2007, the one of the CPDRC dancing inmates doing the Thriller dance hit big and went viral. As of 2020, more than 59 million people had watched the sea of orange-clad people amble and groove like zombie monsters. Whitesnake is 1987 all the way, and the band's mega-hit Here I Go Again is perhaps the catchiest hard rock song of all time. Whitesnake has a complex history that stretches over four decades. Here are a few things you probably don't know about the band. Whitesnake wasn't exactly an overnight sensation. David Coverdale formed the band after leaving Deep Purple and launching a brief solo career releasing two albums. He then formed a band he initially called David Coverdale's Whitesnake, which he quickly and wisely shortened to just Whitesnake. The band released its first album, Trouble, in 1978. Over the next few years, Whitesnake released five more albums to modest success in the UK and Europe, and a distinct lack of success in the United States. The band's sound was initially out of step with what was happening in rock music at the time. It was a very bluesy, rough 1970s sound that simply wasn't in vogue in a world where punk rock and new wave were dominating the rock charts. Coverdale, to his credit, understood this and worked to change the band's sound. He switched up the personnel in his band and began writing songs that leaned more into the heavy metal sound that was popular at the time. Thanks to this evolution, Whitesnake's sixth album, Slide It In, became their initial modest breakthrough in the U.S. six years after their formation. 
They mounted a massive tour and got a few singles on the charts, and the stage was set for the band to take a tremendous leap forward with their next project, which is exactly what happened. Finally, after all these years, Americans have shown great taste. Whitesnake doesn't seem like a band that would be mentioned in the same sentence as blues legend B.B. King. The differing musical styles, cultural backgrounds, and fashion sense would seem to prove that these were two completely opposite worlds that would never mix. But it's important to note that band founder David Coverdale came out of a blues-inspired 1970s rock tradition thanks to his time in Deep Purple. So it's not entirely crazy to learn that one of Whitesnake's signature hit songs was originally written with the intention of giving it to King to record. According to Coverdale, Whitesnake guitarist Bernie Marsden had interviewed King for a British magazine in 1978. At the end of the interview, King invited Marsden and Whitesnake to write a song for him, and the band was excited to do so. The song the band came up with was Fool For Loving You. If you think that sounds familiar, that's because it eventually appeared on Whitesnake's 1980 album Ready and Willing. Though they were trying to write for King, the band realized they liked the song too much to give it away. This turned out to be a good move, as the song hit number 13 on the charts in 1980 and number 43 when it was re-recorded and re-released in 1989. If you're just looking at Whitesnake's release history, you'd think the band existed smoothly and without controversy at least until 1989, when the band took an eight-year break between albums. But the fact is that Whitesnake essentially broke up in 1982. There was a lot going on for the band that year, thanks in no small part to Coverdale's efforts to continue to evolve Whitesnake's sound. The band wasn't getting along, and while their albums had sold well in Europe and the UK, they hadn't managed a breakthrough in the all-important US market. Then, Coverdale's daughter Jessica contracted bacterial meningitis. The lead singer decided to put the band on hold while he went home to look after her. The band, however, saw it differently. Guitarist Bernie Marsden, drummer Ian Pace, and bassist Neil Murray say they thought Coverdale was acting like he was Whitesnake and treating them as employees, not co-equal members. So they walked out. That might have been fine with Coverdale. He hired new band members and shaped the band into the hair metal powerhouse he'd been dreaming of. Though Coverdale was a key driving force, another of the main influences over Whitesnake's change in style and sudden success after years of frustration was music titan David Geffen. According to Coverdale, it was Geffen who actually persuaded him to evolve the band's sound in pursuit of success. Coverdale took the advice to heart. He moved to America, realizing that if he wanted to conquer the market, he had to live there. Whitesnake signed to Geffen's label in 1982, released Slide It In in 1984, and over the course of those first two Geffen albums, became a whole new band, as Coverdale later recalled in an interview with Louder, it worked astonishingly well. I sold embarrassingly large amounts of records in a three to five year period. After finally tasting chart success in the US with 1984's Slide It In, Whitesnake was poised for huge success. American radio had finally given them significant airplay, a world tour had cemented a fan base, and their US music label, Geffen, was very supportive of the band. David Coverdale hired a new guitarist, John Sykes, and the two began writing songs in 1985 while Coverdale, always reinventing the band, looked around for a new drummer and other personnel. Things were going very well. Coverdale had resurrected an old demo from his Deep Purple days, a song that would become their huge hit, Still of the Night. And a song he'd originally written for Tina Turner, Is This Love, would also be a smash for the band. With the new lineup finally in place, the band headed into the studio, but the biggest album of Whitesnake's career almost didn't happen. Around this time, Coverdale came down with a severe sinus infection that prevented him from singing for a full eight months as he recovered. The infection was so bad he was given 50-50 odds of ever singing again and needed surgery to recover. Even worse, guitarist Sykes attempted to push Coverdale out of the band and replace him with another singer. When Coverdale re-entered the studio, the music tracks had been recorded but the band had been fired. For many casual fans, Here I Go Again is a catchy rock song about moving forward and pursuing relentless dreams. The song was a smash top 10 hit for Whitesnake in 1987. And the music video starring Tawny Katane is an iconic image of the late 1980s. But the truth about Here I Go Again is a lot darker. The song had originally appeared on Whitesnake's 1982 album Saints and Sinners, and David Coverdale wrote the song about his crumbling marriage to Julia Borkowski, who he'd married in 1974. 
The couple divorced in 1978, and it was a dark time for Coverdale as he found himself sleeping in a separate bed even after they'd just welcomed a daughter together. It was in this frame of mind that he wrote his most successful song. It makes sense if you pay attention to the lyrics, many of which are all about feeling lost and asking for strength and guidance while pushing forward. Once you hear it, you can never hear the song in the same way again. Here I Go Again is also, interestingly, a song that had to be recorded three times before it became a hit. After Saints and Sinners, Coverdale recorded it two more times for the band's 1987 self-titled album. Once the final version hit, though, it really hit. The image of Tawny Katane cavorting on top of two Jaguars in the music video for White Snake's Here I Go Again is one of the most iconic moments of the golden age of music video. But it was actually supposed to be another very famous face from the 1980s doing those impressive cartwheels. David Coverdale and Katane already knew each other when the music video was being planned, but Katane wasn't originally cast in the role. Instead, supermodel Claudia Schiffer was supposed to appear. At the time, Schiffer was red hot as the face of the iconic Guest Jeans advertising campaign. One evening, Coverdale and Katane were out to dinner when Coverdale received an urgent message from the label. Schiffer had been forced to drop out of the video. He took Katane with him to the meeting with the video's director, Marty Kallner. The moment Kallner saw Katane, he asked if she'd take Schiffer's place, and naturally, Katane said yes. Coverdale brought in Paula Abdul to work with Katane on her moves, but Abdul reportedly told him Tawny didn't need any help. I did floor, and I did the balance beam. So, you know, dancing on two Jaguar hoods, it was snap. That decision had real-life consequences for Coverdale and Katane, who married two years later and divorced less than two years after that. Rock and roll is a notoriously chaotic business, and Whitesnake epitomizes that. There are only two constants in the history of Whitesnake, lead singer David Coverdale and an almost entirely new lineup of musicians every few years. In 1982, for example, Coverdale fired most of the band and reformed it with a new direction. And in 1987, he did pretty much the same thing before the album Whitesnake was even released. By the time Coverdale recovered from his devastating sinus infection and was preparing to promote the self-titled album, he'd fired basically the whole band again after they tried to force him out. That meant he needed new musicians not just for the upcoming tour, but for the music videos tied to the album's singles. So, when you watch an iconic video like Here I Go Again, you're actually watching a lie. With the exception of Coverdale and guitarist Adrian Vandenberg, none of the band members in that video actually played on the track they're miming. If you're a musician seeking job security, stay away from Whitesnake. Over the course of 42 years, the band has had 40 members aside from David Coverdale, who has been the only member to appear on every single album. In fact, it's not uncommon to find a musician who toured with the band but never appeared on a recording or the other way around. I mean, I wish the guys well. I'm familiar with all of them. This is because Coverdale has always been willing to change the band's sound and approach when he thinks it's necessary, which often requires fresh blood, and possibly because he's difficult to work with. According to Louder, the entire band revolted against Coverdale's leadership in 1982, resulting in a complete purge and a new lineup. What's really remarkable is how many top-notch musicians have had their White Snake moment. People like legendary drummer Cozy Powell have made their mark in the band, after all. But perhaps the most remarkable statistic is the fact that the band has had 12 lead guitarists in its time, including absolute legends Vivian Campbell, Steve Vai, and John Sykes. If you're going to rearrange the lineup of your band every few years, after all, you might as well hire Hall of Fame caliber musicians. You might think that by 1985, David Coverdale was pretty rich. At the age of 22 in 1973, he became the lead singer of one of the biggest bands in the world, Deep Purple. Then he launched a solo career and finally put together Whitesnake, a band that by that point had released six albums, toured the world, and enjoyed not inconsiderable success around the world. And yet, by the mid-1980s, Coverdale was nearly $3 million in debt by the time he was working on the album that would become 1987's Whitesnake. Coverdale blames poor advice from the band's management over the years, and was apparently so desperate to get away from one manager that in the early 1980s, he took on more debt in exchange for a contract release. It all worked out, Whitesnake's self-titled 1987 album was a massive hit. Although the album only made it to number two on the charts, it kept charting for months on the strength of hits like In the Still of the Night and Here I Go Again. 
The album sold more than 15 million copies around the world, and Coverdale went from being millions in debt to having millions in the bank. From near-death experiences to out-of-control drug use, Duran Duran's heyday was one crazy ride. But despite their string of 80s hits, the group's personal lives didn't always end up on top. The members of a band the public knows are the singers and musicians, but the rock stars are dependent on managers working behind the scenes to make recording sessions and live tours run smoothly. Duran Duran was just one of the acts that depended on tour manager Craig Duffy, who also provided services for Radiohead, U2, and Lily Allen, among others. According to Enemy, Duffy was a father to two children and was undergoing treatment for throat cancer in 2021. He was driving with his partner, former hospital worker and mother of two, Sue Partimer, when they were involved in a collision on May 21st of that year near Tivington, on the border of Devon and Somerset. Duffy and Partimer died in the crash, while a third person suffered critical injuries. Duffy's death was confirmed to Devon Live by Duran Duran's former publicist, Gerard Franklin, who paid tribute to Duffy's reputation as a well-liked and respected support to the many famous acts that depended on him. Lead singer and lyricist of Duran Duran, Simon Lebon has been a sailor since he was young. The music video for the song Rio was shot on board a ship in the Caribbean. In 1985, when the band's fame was at its zenith and the telecast of the Live Aid concert brought them to over a billion viewers worldwide, Lebon turned his attention to his hobby. He planned to participate in the Fastnet yacht race, held between the Isle of Wight and Plymouth. As Le Bon himself recalled for the BBC years later, the Fastnet was meant to be a stepping stone on the way to a trip around the world by sail. But while his ship Drum idled off the Cornish coast with Le Bon and his crew aboard, the keel broke off the hull. The ship capsized, trapping its passengers inside as fumes from the damaged vessel leaked out. The only light came from sunlight filtered through the ocean water. Le Bon said the accident was the most harrowing of his life. It's the most dangerous situation I've ever been in. He and his crew were trapped in the yacht for 40 minutes. Fortunately, a rescue helicopter from the 771 Royal Naval Air Squadron managed to save everyone. Le Bon was able to recognize himself in footage of the rescue by his bare legs. In escaping the ship, his pants snagged on something and had to be left behind. Duran Duran benefited enormously from coming into prominence alongside MTV. Rolling Stone noted in 1983 how the network popularized some of the band's songs before they made a splash on radio. Besides winning near-constant airtime, the quality and visual range of Duran Duran's videos helped them stand out from the pack. Among the more notable videos the band produced in the 1980s was for their hit song The Wild Boys. The elaborate shoot done at a cost of £650,000 at England's famed Pinewood Studios featured choreography by noted dancer and choreographer Arlene Phillips. Phillips also told the Birmingham Mall that the Wild Boys nearly cost Simon Le Bon his life. The video featured a large windmill, and Le Bon was strapped to one of its sails as it rotated, the ends of the sails dipping into a pool of water. By Phillips' memory, the windmill became stuck while Le Bon's head was under the water. Strapped in as he was, he had no way to get free and breathe, and divers had to go into the pool to rescue him. Phillips found it a horrible sight, one that lingered on in her memory. It is worth mentioning that Le Bon himself insists that he wasn't in any danger during filming, and that reports of his near death during the Wild Boys shoot amount to an urban legend. Duran Duran was not sold to the public as wild rock and rollers. Their image as guitarist Andy Taylor recalled for the Evening Standard was of clean living pop stars. Duran Duran is a pop group. We're a pop group for young people with a lot of energy. That image was shattered in 1984 when the British tabloids published an expose on the prodigious use of cocaine by various members. A former doorman to the Rum Runner Club, where Duran Duran first came together, betrayed their confidence and wrote an eyewitness account of the band's wild, drug-fueled behavior at a Christmas party. The only member not to be castigated was Roger Taylor, who didn't partake. While the story broke in a tawdry and backstabbing way, Duran Duran's struggles with drugs were real. Andy wrote that he and John Taylor were the biggest users of the group. The hectic work schedule demanded by the band's record company was rough on them, and cocaine initially helped fuel them through the workload. John was probably under the influence when he established contact with Cubby Broccoli, producer of the James Bond series, leading to Duran Duran performing the title song for A View to a Kill. 
But by the mid-1980s, cocaine began fraying Andy's nerves and affecting his temper with fans and bandmates. Coinciding with a split within Duran Duran over rival side projects, the escalating drug use only worsened the divide. A cascade of embarrassing incidents made Andy question his lifestyle, and he left Duran Duran after filming the music video for the Bond song. Excessive drug use made Duran Duran guitarist Andy Taylor disillusioned with the music star life, and he left the band in the mid-1980s. For bassist John Taylor, the road out of drug addiction would be longer and more violent. Andy wrote that John's cocaine habit led him to make brash remarks to film producers and to fall to pieces after making a spectacle of himself in front of the Rolling Stones. But a more serious incident, recalled by Andy in his memoir, Wild Boy, My Life with Duran Duran, occurred when John, drunk on vodka and probably high on cocaine, nearly lost his foot after dancing on a broken bottle. Slicing his foot open wasn't a wake-up call for John. He had his own chance to recount his drug experiences with his own memoir in 2012, though he told The Hollywood Reporter that he hadn't looked to Andy for a guide on how to discuss their mutual bad habits. John said that recalling his addictions was the most difficult part of writing the book and that it wasn't a tell-all. Not all the attention received by pop and rock stars is positive. There are entitled, obsessive, or otherwise badly behaved fans, hangers-on, and hucksters, tabloid press looking for salacious gossip, and pushers and enablers of bad habits. But Duran Duran had the unique experience of facing actual assailants in the 1980s. While in Munich on tour in 1982, according to Andy Taylor in Wild Boy, My Life with Duran Duran, John and Roger Taylor met up with English singer Brian Ferry at a club. What was a pleasant evening took a dark turn when a group of men with baseball bats rushed the musicians. Roger and a security guard were severely injured by the attack. John said in his own memoir, In the Pleasure Groove, Love, Death, and Duran Duran, that he was so high on drugs that he can't remember much of that night, but does remember seeing Roger covered in blood after a trip to the hospital. In a fit of rage, John punched his right hand through a light fixture. Andy told the Scotsman years later that Duran Duran was so unnerved by the attack that they left Germany the day after. With their drummer and bassist too badly injured to play, they needed to cancel the remaining dates on their tour until replacements could be arranged. Andy told the outlet, We managed to play down the scale of the injuries in the media. Today, it would have been a huge international incident. As Duran Duran's popularity soared and John Taylor's drug use increased, he also found romance. According to his memoir in The Pleasure Groove, Taylor met Amanda Decadene after 10 years with the band. he just endured a fake paternity claim when Decadene came into his life. She had a reputation for wild, rock star-style behavior, and Taylor liked her way of thinking and navigating the media. Within months, the couple was expecting a child, and they married in 1991. Taylor described marriage and fatherhood as stabilizing forces in his life. But there was a 10-year age gap between Taylor and Decadene, who enjoyed going out from their Los Angeles home and networking when Taylor, exhausted from touring, wanted to stay in. As the couple drifted apart, they tried therapy, but the gulf was too great. It didn't help that marriage wasn't enough to pull Taylor out of his addictions. I just didn't have that off switch. I just kept, kept going. The therapy sessions were productive enough that Taylor arranged to see another therapist while working in London, who told him sobriety was necessary for any productive work in counseling. After initial resistance and another wild ride of boozing, Taylor agreed. Decadene helped see him into a treatment center in Tucson, but it was too late for their marriage. The couple separated in 1995. According to John Taylor's In the Pleasure Grove, the band's founder and keyboardist, Nick Rhodes, met Julianne Friedman on a boat trip around Santa Monica. They became inseparable after that encounter, and they married in 1984. John described their wedding, held at the Savoy Hotel in London, as a pop culture sensation, and it was eagerly devoured by the press. Friedman's presence in Rhodes' life, or rather her presence among Duran Duran, didn't sit well with everyone. In his memoir, Wild Boy, Andy Taylor notes that he and Rhodes regularly clashed and that Friedman also didn't get on well with him. But Rhodes and Friedman increasingly didn't get on with one another. In an excerpt published in the Evening Standard, Andy recalled an incident at the Plaza Athene when Friedman locked Rhodes out of their room and began screaming on the balcony, to the point people worried she might fall. The fire brigade was called in to talk her down. The couple divorced in 1992. The Daily Mail claimed that it was a contentious split, with fights over the custody of their daughter and their art collection. Rhodes received custody of their daughter and most of the pieces, but Friedman kept a painting by Andy Warhol given to the couple on their wedding day. 
She later sold it to fund her chef's career, telling the Mail that Rhodes was aware of the sale. The members of Duran Duran were all young and unknown when they signed a contract with music publisher Gloucester Place in the 1980s. Under the agreement, they produced their first three albums and the James Bond title song, A View to a Kill, with Gloucester retaining the copyright. Decades later, Gloucester was a subsidiary of the US-based Sony ATV, and under American copyright law, artists can reclaim control of their work after 35 years. Duran Duran moved to do just that in 2016. In a UK court, Gloucester argued that in doing so, the band was in breach of contract, and that the terms of their agreement with Gloucester clearly allowed the company to retain copyright. US law didn't apply, they said. The judge assigned to the case, while conceding that it was a difficult case with fair arguments on both sides, ultimately agreed with Gloucester. Nick Rhodes said in reaction to the ruling that it set a terrible precedent for other recording artists of Duran Duran's generation. While Simon Le Bon questioned why anyone would want to work with Sony ATV given the way they treated talent. The British Academy of Songwriters, Composers and Artists weighed in, hoping that Duran Duran would appeal the decision. Why did the hottest rock band of the 80s almost sue the hottest boy band of the 2010s? And what are they saying if you play their songs backward? Even the biggest Def Leppard fan might not know these facts. Def Leppard became one of the biggest bands in the world during the 1980s, but the band only exists because of coincidence. According to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, teenager and budding singer Joe Elliott was late for his bus one day. While waiting around, he met another teen named Pete Willis. As fate would have it, they both were wannabe rock stars. They hit it off, with Willis introducing Elliott to his band Atomic Mass. This project counted among its members bassist Rick Savage, but Elliott didn't want to join this pre-existing collective, having his own ideas about the rock band he wanted to form. He wanted one that mixed heavy metal guitars with pop-friendly melodies. The name he had in mind? Def Leppard. At the time, you just think, this is great, this, you know, we're gonna be huge. <laughs> Willis and Savage were intrigued and left Atomic Mass to join Elliott's project. The band quickly took form, adding guitarist Steve Clark and adopted its new name. According to the group's first drummer, Tony Kenning, Elliott came up with the name while doodling. Joe used to make posters up for bands whilst at school and started making up band names. We thought the name was pretty cool, and later I suggested changing the spelling. After just 15 months as the drummer for Def Leppard, Kenning was out of the band. His replacement? 15-year-old Rick Allen. Willis wouldn't make it for the long haul with Def Leppard either. While his playing appeared on the band's first two albums, and he toured the US with the band in 1981, his alcohol consumption affected his attitude and abilities. Allen claimed, Every time he had a drink, it would completely change his personality. Willis became so unreliable that Elliott put guitarist Phil Collin on standby. Def Leppard officially fired Willis in 1982, with Collin getting his job. The Union Jack is the national flag of the United Kingdom, and two native acts have used the pattern as the cornerstone of their look. Ginger Spice of the Spice Girls, and Def Leppard. Rocking the red, white, and blue flag of their homeland is more than simply national pride. In fact, it all started accidentally early in the band's history. According to Elliot in a SiriusXM interview, Alan wore Union Jack short shorts as early as 1981, but no one took much notice. But then Alan and Elliot wore Union Jack wear in the 1983 video for their single, Photograph. Originally, Elliot had allocated 25 pounds for an outfit, and after he bought what he wanted, he had 8 pounds left, just enough to buy a Union Jack shirt. After Elliot and Alan sported their Union Jack wear in the video, fans started wearing Union Jack clothes to live shows. Seeing this, the band decided to make shirts like Elliot's for the merchandise table, saying, we thought it was hilarious, all these Americans buying this Union Jack shirt, and like 200 years ago, they'd be kicking us out of the country. Def Leppard is considered a definitive British band, and yet the group had a hard time finding attention or success in their homeland. None of its singles from the late 70s and early 80s made it above number 41 on the UK singles chart. Their first two albums fell off the British album chart quickly as well. By the time the group was recording their video for Photograph from their third album, Pyromania, they didn't have very much money. Fortunately, the video for Photograph is what broke the band out, but in America. Elliot told Songfax, it went through the roof because of MTV. 
Once people started getting cable all over the states, this fledgling MTV thing took off. MTV led to radio airplay, which led to more MTV, and Photograph hit number one on Billboard's rock chart. Only after Def Leppard found fame in America did they find greater success in their homeland, with the 1987 single Animal being the group's first hit in the UK. Joe Elliott's got vocals like nobody else, and I think that that was the main reason why they're you know, so big over here. German language music was seemingly all over English language radio in the mid 1980s. Nina's 99 Luftballons hit number two on the pop chart, while Falco topped it with Rock Me Amadeus. Def Leppard scored one of its earliest hits with Rock of Ages, a song which begins with a high pitched individual stating, apparently in German, Gunter Glieben Glatten Globen. But don't bother running it through an online translator because, according to the Def Leppard FAQ, it doesn't mean anything. While recording the song, producer Robert Mutt Lang grew so weary of giving a 1, 2, 3, 4 countdown for takes that he began to make up funny nonsense phrases instead. Backmasking is a phenomenon involving musical artists or producers inserting backwards dialogue or singing into songs. Sometimes when they are played in reverse, they reveal a secret message. Def Leppard experimented with backmasking and hidden messages, generating both mystery and controversy. On their late 80s hit, Rocket, a strange voice can be heard near the beginning of the song. Reversed, it's merely Elliot singing, We're fighting with the gods of war, a clip from the band's song, Gods of War. Def Leppard's only number one hit on the American pop chart was Love Bites in 1988. For years, a rumor persisted that, near the end of the song, there was a hidden crude message about Jesus Christ. In 1997, Colin refuted the idea in a Q&A for Mercury Records' website. For the last time, there is no reference to Jesus Christ. There is, however, a keyboard vocoder making fun of a Yorkshire accent. On December 31, 1984, Allen was driving outside Sheffield, England. He didn't judge a curve correctly, lost control, slammed into a stone wall, and flipped the car. Despite wearing his seatbelt, Allen was thrown from the car and his left arm was torn off. I guess as I rolled this car, the seatbelt was the thing that, that actually took my arm off. A police officer soon arrived, as did a nurse who lived nearby who had a cooler of ice in preparation for a New Year's party. Together they located the arm, loaded it up, and sent it with Allen to the hospital. Microsurgeons worked for 10 hours to reattach the arm, but complications led them to believe that Allen's best shot at survival would be a full amputation. And just like that, the 21-year-old drummer had seemingly lost his livelihood along with his limb. Amazingly, while in recovery, Alan realized that he could still keep good time with his feet. He would develop a custom drum kit which combined his feet and remaining arm with electronic programming, allowing his drumming career to continue and to flourish. Hysteria is considered a landmark album, bridging the harder-edged British metal of the 70s with the slick hair metal of the 80s. The album's fresh but familiar sound led to more than 20 million copies sold, but that may not have happened had Hysteria gone as originally planned. Mutt Lang was initially on board, having produced Def Leppard's first two albums, High and Dry and Pyromania, but he pulled out due to exhaustion after working with the Cars on their album, Heartbeat City. Group management installed Jim Steinman as replacement producer, even though he was known for an overly theatrical style, as heard on Meatloaf's Bad Out of Hell. This led the band to consider him a bad fit. He thought the band tuning their instruments was a take, he'd show up hours late to sessions, and then wanted to change the carpet in the studio because he didn't like it. After eight half-finished songs, Def Leppard forced management to buy Steinman out of his contract. After a delay due to Allen's lost arm, Lang was brought back on to produce Hysteria after all. Emboldened by the multi-platinum success of Pyromania, which also packed a whopping six singles that hit the top 40 of the American mainstream rock chart, Def Leppard and Lang set out with even loftier ambitions for its follow-up, Hysteria. Well, the album is the that's that's the that's the king. We're working. We're slaves to this record. Colin was quoted in an interview claiming that Lang said, "Let's make a rock version of Michael Jackson's Thriller, an album you can have seven singles off." The numerous singles idea got back to Def Leppard's cover designer, Andy Airfix, who was dealing with a monumental shift in his profession at that moment. Vinyl records, with their huge covers, were on the way out in favor of compact discs. Knowing this, he approached the art for Hysteria as a celebration of 12-inch vinyl before its death. Airfix designed the cover by breaking down the image into nine separate and distinct sections. Those panels became the artwork for each of the commercial singles off the album, which included Animal, Pour Some Sugar On Me, and Love Bites. 
While Def Leppard toured in support of Hysteria, the Rock and Roll Road Show came to the United States, kicking off in Glen Falls, New York on October 1, 1987. That night, the band launched an innovative concert format in which they played on a stage positioned in the center of their audience. This is typically referred to as in the round. Savage told Billboard, We just did not know how it was going to work because we knew wherever you were on stage, you would always have your back to some part of the audience. The lack of a backstage area presented other challenges. The seating arrangement made it tough to get equipment and people onto the stage. According to Colin's memoir, Adrenalized, crew members hid them in huge laundry baskets and wheeled them on and off stage. When Def Leppard hit big in the U.S. with Pyromania, the band hit the road. They toured some of the biggest arenas in the U.S. and enlisted Swiss hard rock band Crocus to be its opening act. While there was certainly some overlap between their sound and fan bases, the arrangement didn't go well. Allegedly, on the very first night of the tour, the members of Crocus were told to stay off the ramps and scaffolding on stage, as those had been built and reserved specifically for choreographed movements by Elliott. Singer Mark Storace ignored that directive almost immediately. After seeing Def Leppard's show once, he lifted and repeated all of Elliott's moves. This made Def Leppard look like the ripoff artists, which Crocus's manager Butch Stone bragged about to the press. A physical fight then broke out between him and Allen, with Crocus member Chris Von Rohr claiming in an interview, It became very ugly, and when our manager punched the drummer, naturally we were dumped from the tour. Steve Clark was a heavy drinker, and by the late 1980s, it posed serious problems to his own health and the state of Def Leppard. According to Collins' memoir, Adrenalized, Clark was discovered unconscious in a Minneapolis bar and was taken to a hospital. The band helped Clark get into a rehab center, but when he got out, he started relying on substances again. In January 1991, during a six-month leave of absence from Def Leppard in order to get sober, Clark died in his sleep. An autopsy reportedly showed that Clark accidentally overdosed on alcohol, codeine, and painkillers. Def Leppard continued on, and in 1992 started playing shows with a new guitarist, seasoned metal guitarist Vivian Campbell, a veteran of the bands Dio and Whitesnake. Def Leppard is ranked among the most successful rock and roll bands of all time, selling 100 million albums over the last 40 years. But Def Leppard is all alone in another category. The hard rock band set a world record which remains unchallenged to this day. Somebody's got to do it for the first time, why not? It'd be us, we always like, you know, breaking barriers. On October 23, 1995, as a publicity stunt to promote the release of its first ever Best Of collection, Vault, Def Leppard Greatest Hits 1980-1995, the group played an all-acoustic show in Tangier, Morocco. Then, the band hopped onto a plane for a flight to London, England, where they played a second acoustic concert. After that wrapped, the band took another jet, halfway across the world, to Vancouver, British Columbia, where they played their third and final acoustic set of the day. Never before had a musical group played three shows on three different continents all in one 24-hour period. With just one song, Def Leppard inspired two major movements that would become hallmarks of hard rock and hair metal. In 1981, the band included the guitar-driven ballad Bring It On The Heartbreak on the album High & Dry. The song remained a mostly forgotten album cut until 1984, when, following the release of their smash hit Pyromania, Def Leppard issued a remix of the track. This time, the song made a respectable showing on the Billboard Hot 100 pop chart and showed other hard rock bands that they could find airplay and financial success by showing off their softer sides. Some power ballads inspired by the remix included Heaven by Warrant, Every Rose Has Its Thorn by Poison, and Home Sweet Home by Motley Crue. But when Def Leppard would play Bringing On The Heartbreak Live, they quickly got bored with their typical arrangement. Colin claimed, We thought it would be great if we started it acoustic and then went into Steve Clark's solo. Before long, a number of other prominent hard rock bands were swapping the electric guitars for acoustic ones. This would include the bands Tesla, Scorpions, and Bon Jovi. I heard that you guys were working on your most sensitive personal song yet. What was the name of it again? On your knees. Def Leppard wrapped up a decade-plus of pop chart success with the 1993 single Miss You in a Heartbeat. It reached number 39 on the Billboard Hot 100, marking the last time Def Leppard would hit the top 40. It was a bit of a departure for the band, as it was a tender ballad and the only Def Leppard song written entirely by Phil Collin on his own. Also, unlike most other Def Leppard songs, it's not about romance or rock and roll. Colin told Songfax, Rory, my son, when he was a little baby, that's when I wrote that about missing the family and all that stuff. But Def Leppard didn't initially record the tune, as Colin gave it to his friend, Bad Company singer Paul Rogers, to record with his supergroup, The Law. 
After that version of Miss You in a Heartbeat was a minor hit on American Rock Radio in 1991, Def Leppard then decided to give it a go. Despite being issued as the B-side of another single, it became a smash hit in the Philippines and Canada. In 1993, Def Leppard put out Miss You in a Heartbeat in the U.S., where it performed well. Pour Some Sugar On Me was a monster hit for Def Leppard in 1987. The arena rock meets metal sing-along hit number two on the Hot 100 and became a time capsule of where pop music was heading at the time. Not only was radio-friendly pop metal picking up steam, but so was hip-hop. Def Leppard cribbed its ideas for the song from another rock band appropriating the conventions of the rap genre. Elliot explained, When we did Pour Some Sugar On Me, it was only written because Run DMC and Aerosmith had done Walk This Way. All of the sudden, rock and rap did mix, so we wrote our own. The song's origins are almost accidental. Def Leppard had nearly finished recording the album Hysteria and had spent two years completing 11 tracks. Elliot started messing with a new idea that he had for a song on an acoustic guitar in the studio when he was all alone. The rest of the band were on sabbatical, and Lang had taken a break. We just started playing this riff, chorus thing, three-chord turnaround, and singing the chorus, I guess. At that point, Lang returned and after calling the bit the best thing he'd heard for many years, immediately started to record the song as he and Elliot fleshed it out. In 1985, Tipper Gore, wife of Senator Al Gore, formed a committee with other congressional spouses and concerned parents called the Parents Music Resource Center. According to Rolling Stone, Gore and her cohort held hearings about the perceived rise of perverse, profane, and inappropriate content in pop and rock music. They also pressed the need for a rating system to alert parents of impressionable young listeners. The proposed rating system included X for sexual content, V for violence, O for references to the occult, and DA for lyrics about drugs and alcohol. The PMRC singled out 15 songs as the most egregious and representative offenders, which included tunes by metal bands like Judas Priest, Wasp, and Motley Crue. This also included High and Dry Saturday Night, a 1981 Def Leppard track about day drinking. People shouldn't be talking like that and, and having those thoughts and feelings. Elliot defended his band against the attacks, claiming rock and roll songs about partying and drinking were part of the entertainment. The kids like us to do that. We like to do as well, but we don't write about it all the time, and a lot of people seem to think that's it. Boy band sensation One Direction topped the album chart in December 2013 with their album Midnight Memories, powered in part by a hard-rocking title track with a chorus that, to some, bore more than a passing resemblance to the hook of Def Leppard's 1987 staple, Pour Some Sugar On Me. Def Leppard reportedly consulted its lawyers to check if the songs were so similar as to invite a lawsuit or a revision in songwriting credits. However, while members of Def Leppard publicly acknowledged similarities, they declined to file any suits over it. According to Courthouse News Service, back in 2009, Def Leppard found itself on the other side of a lawsuit. They were named as defendants in a suit filed by Trudy Green Management. The company claimed that it agreed to handle the band's affairs in tandem with HK Management for a 7.5% commission. But after handling a 2008 Def Leppard tour of Europe, Green alleged that she was never paid after she had been fired mid-tour. In January 2016, Def Leppard set out on Hysteria on the High Seas, a concert series set on the MSC Divina cruise ship. However, just before the band set sail, Elliot contracted pneumonia. Everybody gets ill, you know, I mean, whether it be a singer loses his voice or stupidly a guitarist cutting his finger slicing an orange. Elliot told Express, it totally destroyed my vocal cords. My throat doctor said to me, if you weren't you, I'd tell you to retire because this is never going to get better. While he still embarked on the tour, he ultimately couldn't sing. He'd introduce the band and then watch off stage as bandmates Campbell and Colin took turns filling in on vocals. For the next set of cruise dates, Elliot still hadn't recovered, so Def Leppard recruited a rotating group of replacement vocalists, which included Mr. Big's Eric Martin and Winger's Kip Winger. Elliot called listening to other people sing his songs the weirdest thing he's ever heard. Def Leppard canceled future tour dates while Elliot began his grueling rehabilitation rehabilitation process. He said, I had to take five months of working every single day for an hour or two with my vocal coach, and it took me about 18 months. From new wave to metal to pop, music in the 80s touched a lot of genres and a lot of lives, but only one album was ever put on trial for murder. 
The Beatles don't typically make lists of the most notorious partiers and drug abusers in rock history, but in 1980, Paul McCartney actually got in trouble for marijuana possession in Japan, and it wasn't a tiny amount. He had a cool half pound of pot on his person when security busted him at Tokyo's Narita Airport. He insisted the drugs were for personal use, but skeptical authorities locked him away in the Tokyo Narcotics Detention Center for nine days nevertheless. He was promptly freed and kicked out of the country, before even going to court. No harm, no foul, just a funny story he gets to tell at parties but it could have been much worse. The amount of drugs he was caught with actually made a smuggling charge possible, which could have come with a seven-year sentence. The country doesn't mess around when it comes to drug trafficking, but the Japanese wanted to avoid the inevitable fuss that would ensue if they actually locked up a living legend for nearly a decade. Years later, McCartney told the Late Late Show host James Corden about the incident, including the part where he learned he might be facing seven years hard labor from fellow inmates during his nine-day stint. That was the sentence oh my God. for what I'd done. I got out because of my celebrity. Black Sabbath frontman Ozzy Osbourne is no stranger to outrageous controversy. There's the time he got arrested for urinating near the Alamo in 1982, the time he almost killed a guy by throwing a TV out of a hotel window, and when he recently admitted to the mirror that he spent much of the pandemic lockdown shooting at birds and cats that wandered onto his property for fun. You want to try everything. Other notorious Osborne legends seem to be more myth than fact, like the infamous ant snorting story seen in Motley Crue's The Dirt. Osborne's former guitarist, Jake E. Lee, told Tone Talk that it was mostly made up, for example. Still, this guy has seen and done some absolutely wild stuff. But the Ozziest Ozzy moment of all time has to be the very real time when, while performing live on stage in 1982, he bit the head off a live bat. Thing is, it wasn't on purpose. As he explained to David Letterman years later, he thought the bat was a rubber prop someone in the audience had tossed on stage stage as a joke. Somebody threw a bat on stage, and I thought it was one of these toy bats. So I picked it up, bite the thing's head off, and suddenly everybody's freaking out because it's a real bat. Money goes fast if you're not careful. I heard it through the grapevine singer Marvin Gaye, a Motown icon with years of hits under his belt, found himself living at home in 1983. On top of the mental health, substance abuse, and financial struggles that put him in that position, he and his father, Marvin Gaye, minus the E, didn't get along. According to history, Gaye Sr. was an abusive alcoholic who, rather than being proud of his son's success, may actually have been jealous of it. Earlier reports indicated growing tensions and assaults, but on April 1, 1984, it got deadly. As the New York Times reported shortly after the incident, police responded to reports of what they called a verbal dispute that led to a physical altercation, where they realized Gay Sr. had shot his son. According to Frankie Gay, who wrote about holding his brother as he died that night and Marvin Gay, my brother, the singer's final words were, I got what I wanted. I couldn't do it myself, so I made him do it. Few rockers of the 80s metal scene partied harder than Motley Crue, whose debauched exploits had become the stuff of rock legend. We f everything up, and we were always walked away unscathed. But on December 8, 1984, tragedy struck. The crew had taken finished glam rockers Hanoi Rocks under their wing during their first United States tour. Crew lead singer Vince Neil and Hanoi Rocks drummer Nicholas Dingley, aka Razzle, both already drunk, hopped into Neil's car to run to the liquor store. While speeding around Beverly Hills, Neil crashed his vehicle into another car. Neil survived, but Razzle, just 24 years old, died on the scene. Uh, Razzle, you know, my buddy from Hanoi Rocks. You know, he died in my arms that night. Hanoi Rocks guitarist Andy McCoy told Metal Express, Razzle disappeared, so did Vince. We went looking for them. We drove past this accident, and I was like, what color was the car they were driving? Because we just passed the f***ing scene of an accident with a bright red sports car. Then I saw Razzle's hat on the street. In a 2005 interview with Blender Magazine, Neil said, I wrote a $2.5 million check for vehicular manslaughter when Razzle died. I should have gone to prison. I definitely deserved to go to prison. But I did 30 days in jail and got laid and drank beer, because that's the power of cash. That's f***ed up. When former second lady Tipper Gore bought her 11-year-old daughter Prince's Purple Rain album, she was shocked at its explicit lyrics. Subsequently, Gore helped to form the Parents Music Resource Center, which put forth an effort to put content warnings on music deemed inappropriate for kids. They don't understand perhaps the difference in what a slasher group might produce versus a more mainstream group. Many musicians cried foul. In the widely watched 1985 Tipper Gore Frank Zappa Senate hearing, also known as the Rock Horn hearing, Gore and the PMRC were opposed by the likes of Frank Zappa, John Denver, and Twisted Sisters Dee Snyder, all of whom claimed to be championing artistic freedom. The beauty of literature, poetry, and music is that they leave room for the audience to put its own imagination, experiences, and dreams into the words. 
Bagor's organization was eventually successful, and parental advisory stickers were slapped onto albums with mature content. Gore stuck to her guns in the decades since. She said to Rolling Stone back in 2015, All of the artists and record companies who still use the advisory label should be applauded for helping parents and kids have these conversations about lyrics around their own values. Interestingly, not everyone thought the stickers were really all that bad for the artists. Music wasn't taken off the shelves, and as MTV explains, the stickers made artists look cool and dangerous, and actually incentivized kids to buy the records. Madonna has never shied away from controversy, but she really pushed the envelope in 1989 when she released the music video for Like a Prayer. Making its debut on Entertainment Tonight, it was immediately clear the video was going to cause problems. It pulls no punches, both in its depiction of murder and racism and its religiously provocative imagery. The video was so late arriving to the E.T. set that there wasn't enough time to do proper damage control before it hit the air. Instead, producers could only edit out the most shocking parts and air what was left in the closing credits of the episode. But when the whole thing finally made it to MTV, on censored, the outrage was real. Predictably, religious organizations were among the loudest detractors of the video, Madonna, and any company associated with showing or distributing it. Italian Roman Catholic historian Roberto De Mattei said at the time, the video is a blasphemy and insult because it shows immorals inside a church. They are trying to keep people from seeing it. Basta per favore! Not even Pepsi, whose commercials often featured Madonna, got off the hook. They were forced to end their relationship with her due to the backlash, but the boycotts fell short of sinking Madonna's career. Like a Prayer was even nominated for MTV Video of the Year. In 1989, Rob Palatis and Fabrice Fab Morvan, better known as R&B duo Millie Vanilli, were performing Girl You Know It's True when the track malfunctioned, repeating the same line over and over. They were clearly lip-syncing, but the incident proved to be the tip of a scandalous iceberg that unraveled their career and ousted the entire act as frauds. Many artists have been caught lip-syncing, but it's a rare day when you find out that they never sang a single word on the albums, either. AP says that the team behind the duo had gone to great lengths to hide the scheme. At one point, they even hired dialect coaches to help Palatis and Morvan, who had thick German and French accents respectively, sound more like the voices on the track, so nobody would get suspicious during interviews. But it was too little too late. Disgraced and humiliated after the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences stripped them of their Grammy, Palatis and Morvan told the Los Angeles Times that they were actually victims, and had only agreed to participate in the fraud because they were so poor when the offer came in that they'd literally been stealing food just to stay alive. According to Morvan, our producer tricked us. We signed contracts as singers, but were never allowed to contribute. It was a nightmare. We were living a lie. At that moment in our lives, we couldn't think better or wiser. We were 22, 23, very naive. A satanic panic gripped 1980s America, with millions convinced that crimes and child abuse were perpetrated by devil worshippers and cults. New and intense scrutiny on the activities of satanic cults. Stories of devil worship and satanic cults corrupting young minds. Simultaneously, metal bands were incorporating evil imagery, from the pentagram on Motley Crue's Shout at the Devil to Iron Maiden's 1982 record Number of the Beast. Unsurprisingly, suburban conservatives and headbangers didn't exactly get along. Occasionally, the courts got involved. On December 23, 1985, Raymond Belknap and James Vance were moved to take their own lives. Belknap died, but Vance lived for a few more years, although he was disfigured in his attempt. The grieving families ultimately pinned the blame on British metalheads Judas Priest, saying they hid subliminal messages in their lyrics that brainwashed the young men into taking their lives. Vance himself even claimed, I believe that alcohol and heavy metal music such as Judas Priest led us to be mesmerized. But there was no hard proof that the band, who denied all responsibility, had secretly infused their music with evil messages. The case was tossed. Years later, Priest frontman Rob Halford told Metro UK, People backed by people who were against heavy metal music said we were writing songs that if listened to in a certain way made you kill yourself. It was insane. Ozzy Osbourne went through it with his song Suicide Solution and then it was our turn. People just don't appreciate that, you know, we're humans with feelings like everybody else and we don't all sing about love. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK-8255.